Chapter 3 Precious Answers to Prayer Part 3 Are you prepared for eternity? In looking over my account books, I meet again and again with the name of one and another who has finished his course. Soon, dear reader, your turn and mine may come. Are you prepared for eternity? Affectionately, I press this question upon you. Do not put it away. Nothing is of greater moment than this point. Yea, all other things, however important in their place, are of exceedingly small importance in comparison with this matter. Do you ask how you may be prepared for eternity, how to be saved, how to obtain the forgiveness of your sins? The answer is, believe in the Lord Jesus, trust in Him, depend upon Him alone as it regards the salvation of your soul. He was punished by God in order that we guilty sinners, if we believe in Him, might not be punished. He fulfilled the law of God, and was obedient even unto death, in order that we disobedient, guilty sinners, if we believe in him, might on his account be reckoned righteous by God. Ponder these things, dear reader, should you have never done so before. Through faith in the Lord Jesus alone can we obtain forgiveness of our sins, and be at peace with God. But believing in Jesus, we become, through this very faith, the children of God, have God as our Father, and may come to Him for all the temporal and spiritual blessings which we need. Thus every one of my readers may obtain answers to prayers, not only to the same extent that we obtain them, but far more abundantly. It may be that few, comparatively, of the children of God are called to serve the Lord in the way of establishing orphan houses, etc. But all of them may, yea, are called upon to trust in God, to rely upon Him in their various positions and circumstances, and apply the word of God, faith, and prayer to their family circumstances, their earthly occupation, their afflictions and necessities of every kind, both temporally and spiritually, just as we, by God's help, in some little measure seek to apply the word of God, faith, and prayer to the various objects of the Scriptural Knowledge Institution for home and abroad. Make but trial of it, if you have never done so before, and you will see how happy a life it is. Truly, I prefer by far this life of almost constant trial if I am only able to roll all my cares upon my heavenly Father, and thus become increasingly acquainted with Him, to a life of outward peace and quietness, without these constant proofs of His faithfulness, His wisdom, His love, His power, His overruling providence, etc. Waiting Only Upon God September the 6th, 1854 Received from Clerkenwell fifty pounds to be used one half for missions and the other half as I thought best. I took the one half for the support of the orphans and find the following remark in my journal respecting this donation. What a precious answer to prayer! Since August the 26th we have been day by day coming to the Lord for our daily supplies. Precious also on account of missionary brethren whom I seek to help, for whom there was nothing in hand when this donation was received. Mr. Muller adds a few remarks to this part of the narrative. 1. Should anyone suppose, on account of its having been stated in the previous pages, that we were repeatedly brought low as to means, that the orphans have not had all that was needful for them, we reply that never, since the work has been in existence, has there a meal-time come, but the orphans have had good nourishing food in sufficient quantity, and never have they needed clothes, but I have had the means to provide them with all they required. 2. Never since the orphan work has been in existence have I asked one single human being for any help for this work, and yet, unasked for, simply in answer to prayer from so many parts of the world, as has been stated, the donations have come in, 
and that very frequently at a time of the greatest need. Mr. Muller writes under date 1859, Every Wednesday evening I meet with my helpers for united prayer, and day by day I have stated seasons when I seek to bring the work with its great variety of spiritual and temporal necessities before the Lord in prayer, having perhaps each day fifty or more matters to bring before him, and thus I obtain the blessing. I ask no human being for help concerning the work. Nay, if I could obtain ten thousand pounds through each application for help, by God's grace I would not ask. And why not? Because I have dedicated my whole life cheerfully to the precious service of giving to the world and to the church a clear, distinct, and undeniable demonstration that it is a blessed thing to trust in and to wait upon God, that He is now, as He ever was, the living God, the same as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, and that if we know and are reconciled to Him through faith in the Lord Jesus, and ask Him in His name for that which is according to His mind, He will surely give it to us, in His own time, provided that we believe that He will. Nor has God failed me at any time. Forty years have I proved His faithfulness in this work. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Under date November the 9th, 1861, Mr. Muller wrote, November the 9th, Saturday evening. When this week commenced, I received only three pounds and nineteen shillings by the first delivery. Shortly after, there came in the course of my reading, through the Holy Scriptures, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 4, Trust ye in the Lord for ever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I laid aside my Bible, fell on my knees, and prayed thus. I believe that there is everlasting strength in the Lord Jehovah, and I do trust in Him. Help me, O Lord, for ever to trust in Thee. Be pleased to give me more means this day, and much this week, though only so little now has come in. That same day, November the 3rd, I received ten pounds from Surbiton, five pounds from a donor residing in Clifton, two pounds from a Bristol donor, and in the course of the week altogether four hundred and fifty-seven pounds came in. Thus Jehovah again proved that in Him is everlasting strength, and that He is worthy to be trusted. Dear believing reader, seek but in the same way to trust in the Lord, if you are not in the habit of doing so already, and you will find, as I have found thousands of times, how blessed it is. But if the reader should be yet going on in carelessness about his soul, and therefore be without the knowledge of God and his dear Son, then the first and most important thing such a one has to do is to trust in the Lord Jesus for the salvation of his soul, that he may be reconciled to God and obtain the forgiveness of his sins. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. May the 26th, 1861. At the close of the period I find that the total expenditure for all the various objects was £24,700 and 16 shillings and fourpence or £67, 13 shillings, 5 pence and 3 farthings per day, all the year round. During the coming year I expect the expenses to be considerably greater, but God, who has helped me these many years, will, I believe, help me in future also. You see, esteemed reader, how the Lord, in His faithful love, helped us year after year. With every year the expenses increased, because the operations of the institutions were further enlarged, but he never failed us. You may say, however, what would you do if he should fail in helping you? My reply is, that cannot be, as long as we trust in him and do not live in sin. But if we were to forsake him, the fountain of living waters, and to hew out to ourselves broken cisterns, which cannot hold water, by trusting in an arm of flesh, or if we were to live in sin, we should then have to call upon him in vain, even though we professed still to trust in him. 
according to that word, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, verse 18. Hitherto, by God's grace, I have been enabled to continue to trust in Him alone, and hitherto, though failing and weak in many ways, yet by God's grace I have been enabled to walk uprightly, hating sin and loving holiness, and longing after increased conformity to the Lord Jesus. October the 21st, 1868 As the days come, we make known our requests to Him, for our outgoings have now been for several years at the rate of more than one hundred pounds each day. But though the expenses have been so great, He has never failed us. We have indeed, as to the outward appearance, like the burning bush in the wilderness, yet we have not been consumed. Moreover, we are full of trust in the Lord, and therefore of good courage, though we have before us the prospect that, year by year, our expenses will increase more and more. Did all my beloved fellow disciples who seek to work for God know the blessedness of looking truly to God alone, and trusting in Him alone, they would soon see how soul-refreshing this way is, and how entirely beyond disappointment, so far as He is concerned. Earthly friends may alter their minds regarding the work in which we are engaged, but if indeed we work for God, whoever may alter his mind regarding our service, he will not. Earthly friends may lose their ability to help us, however much they desire to do so, but he remains throughout eternity the infinitely rich one. Earthly friends may have their minds after a time diverted to other objects, and as they cannot help everywhere, much as they may desire it, they may, though reluctantly, have to discontinue to help us. But he is able, in all directions, though the requirements were multiplied a million times, to supply all that can possibly be needed, and does it with delight, where his work is carried on, and where he is confided in. Earthly friends may be removed by death, and thus we may lose their help, but he lives forever, he cannot die. In this latter point of view, I have especially, during the past forty years, in connection with this institution, seen the blessedness of trusting in the living God alone. Not one, nor two, nor even five, nor ten, but many more who once helped me much with their means, have been removed by death. But have the operations of the institution been stopped on that account? No. And how came this? Because I trusted in God, and in God alone. Thoroughly in heart prepared for trials of faith. Under date July the 28th, 1874, Mr. Muller wrote, It has for months appeared to me, as if the Lord meant by his dealings with us, to bring us back to that state of things in which we were for more than ten years, from August 1838, to April 1849, when we had day by day, almost without interruption, to look to him for our daily supplies, and for a great part of the time from meal to meal. The difficulties appeared to me indeed very great, as the institution is now twenty times larger than it was then, and our purchases are to be made in a wholesale way. But at the same time I am comforted by the knowledge that God is aware of all of this, and that, if this way be for the glory of His name, and for the good of His church and the converted world, I am, by His grace, willing to go this way, and to do it to the end of my course. The funds were thus fast expended, but God, our infinitely rich treasurer, remains to us. It is this which gives me peace. Moreover, if it pleases him, with a work requiring about forty-four thousand pounds a year, to make me do again at the evening of my life what I did from August 1838 to April 1849, I am not only prepared for it, but gladly again I would pass through all these trials of faith, with regard to means, if he only might be glorified, and his church and the world be benefited. Often and often this last point has of late passed through my mind, and I have placed myself in the position of having no means at all left, 
and two thousand and one hundred persons, not only daily at the table, but with everything else to be provided for, and all funds gone, a hundred and eighty-nine missionaries to be assisted, and nothing whatever left, about one hundred schools, with about nine thousand scholars in them, to be entirely supported, and no means for them in hand, about four millions of tracts, and tens of thousands of copies of the Holy Scriptures, yearly now to be sent out, and all the money expended. Invariably, however, with this probability before me, I have said to myself, God, who has raised up this work through me, God, who has led me generally, year after year, to enlarge it, God, who has supported this work now for more than forty years, will still help, and will not suffer me to be confounded, because I rely upon him, I commit the whole work to him, and he will provide me with what I need, in future also, though I know not whence the means are to come. Thus I wrote in my journal, on July the 28th, 1874. The reader will now feel interested in learning how we fared under these circumstances. When I came home, last evening, July the 27th, I found letters had arrived which contained a hundred ninety-three pounds, among which there was one from a missionary in foreign lands, helped by the funds of this institution, who, having come into the possession of some money by the death of a relative, sent a hundred and fifty-three pounds and fourpence for foreign missions. This morning, July the twenty-eighth, came in twenty-four pounds more, so that when I met this afternoon with several of my helpers for prayer for means and various other matters, such as spiritual blessing upon the various objects of the institution, for more rain in this very dry season, the health of our fellow labourers, etc., we had received, since yesterday afternoon, altogether two hundred and seventeen pounds. We thanked God for it, and asked for more. When the meeting for prayer was over, there was handed to me a letter from Scotland, containing seventy-three pounds, seventeen shillings and tenpence, and a paper for thirteen shillings. This was the immediate answer to prayer for more means." August the 12th. The income for this whole week, since August the 5th, has been eight hundred and ninety-seven pounds, fifteen shillings, sixpence halfpenny. September the 16th. Just after giving again prayer for the payment of legacies which have been left, I had a legacy receipt sent for the payment of a legacy of one thousand eight hundred pounds. September the 23rd. Income today, five thousand three hundred and sixty five pounds thirteen shillings and sixpence of which there was sent in one donation five thousand three hundred and twenty seven pounds seven shillings and sixpence the lord be praised strong in faith giving glory to god on march the twenty seventh eighteen eighty one Mr. Muller found that no money remained in hand for the school, Bible, missionary, and tract funds. Nearly £1,400 had been spent for these objects during the previous month, he writes. What was now to be done, dear reader, under these circumstances, when all the money for the above objects was again gone? I reply, we did what we have done for forty-seven years, that is, we waited continually upon God. My dear fellow labourers in Bristol, and my dear wife and myself in America, brought our necessities again and again before the Lord. Here in the United States, besides our habitual daily prayer for help, we had especial seasons, four, five, and six times a day additionally, for pouring out our hearts before our Heavenly Father, and making known our requests unto Him, being assured that help would come and we have not waited upon the Lord in vain. This plan may be despised by some, ridiculed by others, and considered insufficient by a third class of persons. But under every trial and difficulty we find prayer and faith to be our universal remedy, and after having experienced for half a century their efficacy, we purpose, by God's help, to continue waiting upon Him, in order to show to an ungodly world and to a doubting church 
that the living God is still able and willing to answer prayer, and that it is the joy of his heart to listen to the supplications of his children. In Psalm 9, verse 10, the divine testimony regarding Jehovah is, They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. We know him by his grace, and do therefore put our trust in him. April the 27th on March the 27th we had no means at all in hand for these objects, as stated under that date. We have now been helped through one more month in answer to prayer, and have been supplied with all we needed, though that amounted to nearly one thousand pounds, and have twenty-three pounds, eight shillings, sixpence and one farthing left. April the 29th A servant of the Lord Jesus, who, constrained by the love of Christ, seeks to lay up treasure in heaven, having received a legacy of five hundred and thirty-two pounds, fourteen shillings and five pence, gave five hundred pounds of it for these objects. July the 28th, 1881. The income has been for some time past only about the third part of the expenses. Consequently, all we have for the support of the orphans is nearly gone and for the first four objects of the institution we have nothing at all in hand. The natural appearance now is that the work cannot be carried on, but I believe that the Lord will help, both with means for the orphans and also for the other objects of the institution, and that we shall not be confounded, also that the work shall not need to be given up. I am fully expecting help, and have written this to the glory of God, that it may be recorded hereafter for the encouragement of his children. The result will be seen. The foregoing was written at 7 a.m. on July the 28th, 1881. As yet we have the means to meet our expenses, and I expect that we shall not be confounded, though for seven years we have not been so poor. The result has indeed been seen, and will be seen, for more than twenty years since those words were written, and Mr. Muller had thus recorded his confidence in the Lord's help, God has sustained the work, and in May 1902 there was a balance in hand of some thousands of pounds, notwithstanding that more than five hundred thousand pounds had been received and expended since this entry was made in Mr. Muller's journal on July the 28th, 1881. During those twenty years, faith and patience were at times greatly tried. August the 15th, 1881. The balance for the orphans is now reduced to three hundred and thirty-two pounds, twelve shillings and sevenpence, lower than it has been for more than twenty-five years. This sum we have in hand to meet the daily expenses in connection with two thousand one hundred persons. It is only enough for the average outgoings of four and a half days. But our eyes are upon the Lord. I look to my heavenly provider. The total income of today has been twenty-eight pounds, five shillings, twopence halfpenny. August the twenty-second. Part of a legacy left years ago, one thousand pounds was paid, as the answer to many prayers. February the twenty-sixth, eighteen eighty-two. The balance in hand today for the orphans is ninety-seven pounds ten shillings seven and a half pence, viz. twenty-four pounds more than the average expenses of one single day. March the second. Our position now regarding the orphan work is praying day by day, give us this day our daily bread. For a considerable time we have had day by day to look to the Lord for the supply of our daily wants but God has helped us thus far. April the 20th, 1882, when, in the greatest need, we received from Edinburgh one hundred pounds with this statement, the enclosed was intended as a legacy, but I have sent it in my lifetime. June the 3rd, from Watton under Edge, five hundred pounds. A glorious deliverance was this donation, and a precious earnest of what God would do further for us. October the 21st. Received from Watton under Edge one thousand pounds. 
God, in answer to our prayers, spoke to his dear child, and inclined his heart to send us more than ever. Thus he also gives proof that during the previous year, when we were so low as to funds, it was only for the trial of our faith and patience, and not in anger. Nor did he thereby mean to indicate that he would not help us any more. For my own part, I expected further great help from God, and I have not been confounded. August the 17th, 1883 our balance was reduced this afternoon to ten pounds, two shillings and sevenpence. Think of this, dear reader. Day by day, about two thousand one hundred persons are to be provided for in the orphan institution, and ten pounds, two shillings and sevenpence was all that was in hand to do this. You see that we are just in the same position in which we were forty-six years since as to funds. God is our banker. In him we trust, and on him we draw by faith. This was Saturday. In the evening, thirty pounds was received. On Monday, we received a hundred and twenty-nine pounds further, but had to pay out sixty pounds. On Tuesday, we received two hundred and ninety-five pounds, but had to pay out one hundred and eighty pounds. God is pleased continually to vary his mode of dealing with us, in order that we may not be tempted to trust in donors or in circumstances, but in him alone, and to keep our eye fixed upon him. This, by his grace, we are enabled to do, and our hearts are kept in peace. Some ten months later, when the balance in hand was only forty-one pounds and ten shillings, a very little more than one-half of the average expenses for the orphans for one day, and there were sanitary operations advisable to be carried out, the expenses of which would amount to upwards of two thousand pounds. Mr. Muller received a legacy of eleven thousand and thirty-four pounds and six shillings. June the seventh, eighteen eighty four. This is the largest donation I have ever received at one time. This legacy had been above six years in Chancery and year after year its payment was expected, but remained unsettled by the Chancery Court. I kept on praying, however, and for six years prayed day by day that the money might be paid, believing that God in his own time, which is always the best, would help at last. For many legacies in Chancery I had prayed out of the court, and the money was eventually paid. In the present case, too, after faith and patience had been sufficiently exercised, God granted this request likewise. 1893. In the 54th report of the Scriptural Knowledge Institution, Mr. Muller says, The readers of the last report will remember under what particular trials we entered upon the last financial year of the institution, from May the 26th, 1892, to May the 26th, 1893. But we trusted in God. With unshaken confidence we looked to Him, and we expected that we should somehow or other be helped. While thus we went on, my heart was at peace habitually, being assured that all this was permitted by God to prepare a blessing for thousands who would afterwards read the record of His dealings with us during the year from May the 26th, 1892, to May the 26th, 1893. With reference to our dear fellow labourers, Mr. Wright and I have seen already, while passing through the trial, how God has blessed it to them. August the 30th, 1892. This evening, whilst reading in the Psalms, I came to Psalm 81, verse 10, and remembered the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart when reading this verse on December the 5th, 1835, and the effect which this had, not only on leading me to found the greatest orphan institution in the world, but I thought also of the blessing which has thus been brought to tens of thousands of believers and unbelievers all over the world. Putting aside the Bible, therefore, I fell on my knees and asked God that he would graciously be pleased to repeat his former kindness and to supply me again more abundantly with means. Accordingly, in less than half an hour I received fifty pounds from a Bristol donor, and from Redland a large quantity of fish, 
in addition to ninety-seven pounds already received today as the result of much prayer. By the last delivery at 9 p.m., I received five pounds more also, and had thus one hundred and fifty-two pounds in all this day as the result of prayer. November the 11th. There came in today, by the first two deliveries, only about eight pounds, but the Lord increased the income to more than two hundred pounds this day. I am never discouraged by very little only coming in, but say to myself, and also to my dear helpers, more prayer, more patience, and more exercise of faith will bring greater blessing. For thus I have invariably found it since October 1830, now sixty-three years ago, when I first began this life of entire dependence upon God for everything. March the 1st, 1893 The income during this week, ending today, was ninety-two pounds, eight shillings, eight pence and three farthings for the orphans, and nine pounds, eleven shillings and twopence for the other projects, being about the sixth part of our weekly expenses. But now the great trial of our faith was nearly brought to a close, as will presently be seen. March the 4th. This very day God begins to answer our prayers, as we have received a very good offer for the land we have to sell, even one thousand pounds per acre. The beginning of the day was darker as to outward appearances than ever, but we trusted in God for help. The first three deliveries of letters brought us only four pounds, and the remaining three brought us so little that the whole day's income was only eight pounds instead of ninety pounds, the amount we require every day to meet all our expenses. But God has now helped us. We have been able this evening to sell ten acres of land and two-fifths of an acre at one thousand pounds per acre and shall receive ten thousand four hundred and five pounds altogether for the whole of one field. The contract was signed at eight o'clock this evening. Mr. Muller's Departure to Be With Christ On the evening of Wednesday, March the ninth, 1898, Mr. Muller took part in the usual meeting for prayer held in the Orphan House No. 3, retired at his usual hour to rest, and early on the following morning, the 10th of March, alone in his bedroom, breathed his last, realising what had long been with him a most joyous anticipation, viz. that to depart and to be with Christ is far better. March the 14th. This day Mr. Muller's earthly remains were laid in the grave of his first and second wives at Arno Vale Cemetery. The attendant circumstances throughout were very remarkable and interesting to the Christian mind, chiefly as illustrating God's eternal principle, Them that honour me, I will honour. The man who in life sought not his own glory became in death the one to whom all classes delighted to show respect and honour. From the masses of sympathising spectators that lined the streets, from the tearful eyes and the audible prayerful ejaculations that escaped the lips of bystanders, many of them the poorest of the poor, as the orphans filed past following the hearse, from the suspension of all traffic in the principal streets, the tolling of muffled bells and the half-masted flags, and from the dense crowds in the cemetery that awaited the arrival of the funeral company, it seemed as if the whole city had spontaneously resolved to do honour to the man who had not lived for himself, but for the glory of God and the good of his fellows. For some twenty-one months before Mr. Muller's death, the trials of faith and patience were great. Mr. James Wright, Mr. Muller's successor, writes, He who is pleased sometimes to teach his servants how to abound sees it best for them, at other times, to be instructed how to suffer need. For many of the sixty-four years during which this work has been carried on, the former was our experience. We abounded, and richly abounded latterly, and especially during the last two or three years it has been the very reverse. Pressing need has been the rule, a balance in hand over and above our need, the rare exception, yet we have never been forsaken. 
September the 23rd, 1897. Residue of the legacy of the late G. J. Esquire, two thousand six hundred and seventy nine pounds eighteen shillings and sevenpence. This sum was received when we were in the deepest need, and after it had pleased the Lord to allow a very protracted trial of faith and patience. But see, beloved reader, he did not disappoint nor forsake us, as he never does those who really trust in him. The joy of such a deliverance cannot be tasted without the experience of the previous trial. February the 26th, 1898 The following entry under this date is in Mr. Muller's own handwriting. The income today, by the two first deliveries, was seven pounds fifteen shillings and eleven pence. Day by day our great trial of faith and patience continues, and thus it has been more or less now for twenty-one months, yet by thy grace we are sustained. March the first, eighteen ninety eight. The following again is from a memorandum in Mr. Muller's own handwriting under this date. For about twenty-one months, with scarcely the least intermission, the trial of our faith and patience has continued. Now, today, the Lord has refreshed our hearts. This afternoon came in, for the Lord's work, one thousand four hundred and twenty-seven pounds, one shilling and sevenpence, as part of a legacy of the late Mrs. E. C. S. For three years and ten months this money has been in the Irish Chancery Court. Hundreds of petitions have been brought before the Lord regarding it, and now at last this portion of the total legacy has been received. Thus the Lord, in love and faithfulness, greatly refreshed the heart of his servant, only nine days before taking him home to be with himself. Appendices to Answers to Prayer from George Muller's Narratives, edited by A. E. C. Brooks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendix A. Five Conditions of Prevailing Prayer 1. Entire dependence upon the merits and mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only ground of any claim for blessing. See John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, chapter 15, verse 16, etc. 2. Separation from all known sin. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us, for it would be sanctioning sin. Psalm 66, verse 18. 3. Faith in God's word of promise as confirmed by his oath. Not to believe him is to make him both a liar and a perjurer. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. 4. Asking in accordance with his will. Our motives must be godly. We must not seek any gift of God to consume it upon our lusts. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And James chapter 4, verse 3. 5. Importunity in supplication. There must be waiting on God and waiting for God, as the husbandman has long patience to wait for the harvest. James chapter 5 verse 7, Luke chapter 18 verses 1 to 8. Appendix B. The careful and consecutive reading of the Holy Scriptures. Concerning this subject, Mr. Muller says, I fell into the snare into which so many young believers fall, the reading of religious books in preference to the scriptures. I could no longer read French and German novels as I had formerly done to feed my carnal mind, but still I did not put into the room of those books the best of all books. I read tracts, missionary papers, sermons and biographies of godly persons. The last kind of books I found more profitable than others, and had they been well selected, or had I not read too much of such writings, or had any of them tended particularly to endear the scriptures to me, they might have done me much good. I never had been at any time in my life in the habit of reading the holy scriptures. 
when under fifteen years of age I occasionally read a little of them at school. Afterwards God's precious book was entirely laid aside, so that I never read one single chapter of it, as far as I remember, till it pleased God to begin a work of grace in my heart. Now the scriptural way of reasoning would have been, God himself has condescended to become an author, and I am ignorant about that precious book which his Holy Spirit has caused to be written through the instrumentality of his servants, and it contains that which I ought to know, and the knowledge of which will lead me to true happiness. Therefore I ought to read again and again this most precious book, this book of books, most earnestly, most prayerfully, and with much meditation, and in this practice I ought to continue all the days of my life. For I was aware, though I had read but little, that I knew scarcely nothing of it. But instead of acting thus, and being led by my ignorance of the word of God, to study it more, my difficulty in understanding it, and the little enjoyment I had in it, made me careless of reading it. For much prayerful reading of the word gives not merely more knowledge, but increases the delight we have in reading it. And thus, like many believers, I practically preferred, for the first four years of my divine life, the works of uninspired men to the oracles of the living God. The consequence was that I remained a babe, both in knowledge and grace. In knowledge, I say, for all true knowledge must be derived by the Spirit from the Word, and as I neglected the Word, I was for nearly four years so ignorant that I did not clearly know even the fundamental points of our holy faith, and this lack of knowledge most sadly kept me back from walking steadily in the ways of God. For it is the truth that makes us free, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, by delivering us from the slavery of the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. The word proves it, the experience of the saints proves it, and also my own experience most decidedly proves it. For when it pleased the Lord, in August 1829, to bring me really to the Scriptures, my life and walk became very different, and though even since that I have very much fallen short of what I might and ought to be, yet by the grace of God I have been enabled to live more nearly to Him than before. If any believers read this, who practically prefer other books to the Holy Scriptures, and who enjoy the writings of men much more than the Word of God, may they be warned by my loss. I shall consider this book to have been the means of doing much good, should it please the Lord, through its instrumentality, to lead some of His people no longer to neglect the Holy Scriptures, but to give them that preference which they have hitherto bestowed on the writings of men. My dislike to increase the number of books would have been sufficient to deter me from writing these pages, had I not been convinced that this is the only way in which the brethren at large may be benefited through my mistakes and errors, and been influenced by the hope that in answer to my prayers the reading of my experience may be the means of leading them to value the Scriptures more highly, and to make them the rule of all their actions. If anyone should ask me how he may read the Scriptures most profitably, I would advise him that, 1. Above all, he should seek to have it settled in his own mind that God alone, by his Spirit, can teach him, and that therefore, as God will be inquired of for blessings, it becomes him to seek God's blessing previous to reading, and also whilst reading. 2. He should have it, moreover, settled in his mind that, although the Holy Spirit is the best and sufficient teacher, yet that this teacher does not always teach immediately when we desire it, and that therefore we may have to entreat him again and again for the explanation of certain passages, but that he will surely teach us at last, if indeed we are seeking for light prayerfully, patiently, and with a view to the glory of God. 3. It is of immense importance for the understanding of the Word of God to read it in course, so that we may read every day a portion of the Old and a portion of the New Testament, 
going on where we previously left off. This is important, firstly, because it throws light upon the connection, and a different course, according to which one habitually selects particular chapters, will make it utterly impossible ever to understand much of the Scriptures. Secondly, whilst we are in the body, we need a change, even in spiritual things, and this change the Lord has graciously provided in the great variety which is to be found in His Word. Thirdly, it tends to the glory of God, for the leaving out of some chapters here and there is practically saying that certain portions are better than others, or that there are certain parts of revealed truth unprofitable or unnecessary. Fourthly, it may keep us, by the blessing of God, from erroneous views, as in reading thus regularly through the Scriptures we are led to see the meaning of the whole, and also kept from laying too much stress upon certain favourite views. And fifthly, the Scriptures contain the whole revealed will of God, and therefore we ought to seek to read from time to time through the whole of that revealed will. There are many believers, I fear, in our day who have not read even once through the whole of the Scriptures, and yet in a few months, by reading only a few chapters every day, they might accomplish it. 4. It is also of the greatest importance to meditate on what we read, so that perhaps a small portion of that which we have read, or if we have time, the whole, may be meditated upon in the course of the day. Or a small portion of a book, or an epistle, or a gospel, through which we go regularly for meditation, may be considered every day, without, however, suffering oneself to be brought into bondage by this plan. Learned commentaries I have found to store the head, with many notions, and often also with the truth of God. But when the Spirit teaches, through the instrumentality of prayer and meditation, the heart is affected. The former kind of knowledge generally puffs up, and is often renounced when another commentary gives a different opinion, and often also is found good for nothing when it is to be carried out into practice. The latter kind of knowledge generally humbles, gives joy, leads us nearer to God, and is not easily reasoned away. And having been obtained from God, and thus having entered into the heart, and become our own, is also generally carried out. Appendix C. Proving the Acceptable Will of God It is very instructive and helpful to see the way in which Mr. Muller proved the acceptable will of the Lord, when exercised in heart about the enlargement of the orphan work, so that not only three hundred, but a thousand orphans might be provided for. December the 11th, 1850 The especial burden of my prayer, therefore, is that God would be pleased to teach me His will. My mind has also been especially pondering how I could know His will satisfactorily concerning this particular. Sure I am that I shall be taught. I therefore desire patiently to wait for the Lord's time when He shall be pleased to shine on my path concerning this point. December the 26th Fifteen days have elapsed since I wrote the preceding paragraph. Every day since then I have continued to pray about this matter, and that with a goodly measure of earnestness, by the help of God. There has passed scarcely an hour during these days, in which, whilst awake, this matter has not been more or less before me, but all without even a shadow of excitement. I converse with no one about it, Hitherto have I not even done so with my dear wife. From this I refrain still, and deal with God alone about the matter, in order that no outward influence and no outward excitement may keep me from attaining unto a clear discovery of His will. I have the fullest and most peaceful assurance that He will clearly show me His will. This evening I have had again an especial solemn season for prayer, to seek to know the will of God. But whilst I continue to entreat and beseech the Lord that He would not allow me to be deluded in this business, I may say I have scarcely any doubt remaining in my mind as to what will be the issue, 
even that I should go forward in this matter. As this, however, is one of the most momentous steps that I have ever taken, I judge that I cannot go about this matter with too much caution, prayerfulness and deliberation. I am in no hurry about it. I could wait for years, by God's grace, were this his will, before even taking one single step towards this thing, or even speaking to anyone about it. And, on the other hand, I would set to work to-morrow, were the Lord to bid me to do so. This calmness of mind, this having no will of my own in the matter, this only wishing to please my heavenly Father in it, this only seeking His and not my honour in it, this state of heart, I say, is the fullest assurance to me that my heart is not under a fleshly excitement, and that, if I am helped thus to go on, I shall know the will of God to the full. But while I write thus, I cannot but add, at the same time, that I do crave the honour and the glorious privilege to be more and more used by the Lord. I have served Satan much in my younger years, and I desire now with all my might to serve God during the remaining days of my earthly pilgrimage. I am forty-five years and three months old. Every day decreases the number of days that I have to stay on earth. I therefore desire with all my might to work. There are vast multitudes of orphans to be provided for. I desire that thus it may be more abundantly manifest that God is still the hearer and answerer of prayer, and that He is the living God now, as He ever was and ever will be, when He shall, simply in answer to prayer, have condescended to provide me with a house for seven hundred orphans, and with means to support them. This last consideration is the most important point in my mind. The Lord's honour is the principal point with me in this whole matter, and just because that is the case, if He would be more glorified by my not going forward in this business, I should, by His grace, be perfectly content to give up all thoughts about another orphan-house. Surely, in such a state of mind, obtained by the Holy Spirit, Thou, O my heavenly Father, will not suffer Thy child to be mistaken, much less to be deluded. By the help of God I shall continue further, day by day, to wait upon him in prayer, concerning this thing, till he shall bid me act. January the 2nd, 1851 A week ago I wrote the preceding paragraph. During this week I have still been helped, day by day, and more than once every day, to seek the guidance of the Lord about another orphan-house. The burden of my prayer has still been that He, in His great mercy, would keep me from making a mistake. During the last week the book of Proverbs has come in the course of my scripture reading, and my heart has been refreshed in reference to this subject by the following passages. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. By the grace of God I do acknowledge the Lord in my ways, and in this thing in particular. I have therefore the comfortable assurance that He will direct my paths concerning this part of my service, as to whether I shall be occupied in it or not. Further, the integrity of the upright shall preserve them, but the perverseness of fools shall destroy them. Proverbs 11, verse 3. By the grace of God I am upright in this business. My honest purpose is to get glory to God. Therefore I expect to be guided aright. Further, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Proverbs 16, verse 3. I do commit my works unto the Lord, and therefore expect that my thoughts will be established. My heart is more and more coming to a calm, quiet, and settled assurance that the Lord will condescend to use me yet further in the orphan work. Here, Lord, is thy servant. Mr. Muller wrote down eight reasons against and eight reasons for establishing another orphan house for seven hundred orphans. The following is his last reason for so doing. 
I am peaceful and happy, spiritually, in the prospect of enlarging the work, as on former occasions when I had to do so. This weighs particularly with me as a reason for going forward. After all the calm, quiet, prayerful consideration of the subject for about eight weeks, I am peaceful and happy, spiritually, in the purpose of enlarging the field. This, after all the heart-searching which I have had, and the daily prayer to be kept from delusion and mistake in this thing, and the betaking myself to the word of God, would not be the case, I judge, had not the Lord purposed to condescend to use me more than ever in this service. I, therefore, on the ground of the objections answered, and these eight reasons for enlarging the work, come to the conclusion that it is the will of the blessed God, that his poor and most unworthy servant should yet more extensively serve him in this work, which he is quite willing to do. May the 24th From the time that I began to write down the exercises of my mind, on December the 5th, 1850, till this day, ninety-two more orphans have been applied for, and seventy-eight were already waiting for admission before. But this number increases rapidly, as the work becomes more and more known. On the ground of what has been recorded above, I purpose to go forward in this service, and to seek to build, to the praise and honour of the living God, another orphan-house, large enough to accommodate seven hundred orphans. May 